I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh thank you to the Manhattan Institute. Good afternoon, everyone. If I could have your attention, I think we'll get started. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming to our annual uh, James Q. Wilson lecture. Uh, it's my honor today to introduce our introducer, Arthur Brooks. Uh, Arthur has an interesting bio. After spending 12 years as a very successful professional musician, he put away his French horn in the late 1990s and attended the RAND Graduate School, where he was awarded a PhD in policy analysis. And in less than a decade, he's grown to become one of America's most prolific, insightful, and intellectually nimble public policy scholars. From his home base at Syracuse University's Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs, Arthur has published dozens of academic articles, scores of magazine and newspaper essays, and seven books on subjects ranging from philanthropy and social entrepreneurship to the economics of the arts to military operations research. In recent years, the Manhattan Institute has been honored to have Arthur write for our quarterly City Journal and serve as the keynote speaker at our annual Social Entrepreneurship Dinner. And uh, I talked earlier with Arthur. He's allowed me to tell you that at the beginning of this year, I had some conversations with Arthur. I was trying to pursue him and get him as a hire as a Manhattan Institute senior fellow. And you know, he mentioned to me that he had a couple of other irons in the fire. And so I really wasn't quite surprised when AEI offered him the presidency. Uh, because I'm cl it's clear to me that the trustees of AEI saw the same thing I did, which is that he's a first-rate scholar who uses data to ask very important questions in new and interesting ways. And those are qualities that are desperately needed in our think tank business. And I congratulate AEI on their choice. I uh, congratulate Arthur on his new role, and I look forward to working with him. Thank you, Larry. Thank you to all of you. It's a delight for, and an honor for me to be here today. Um, I was always of the view, through, over the course of my life, that people have a tendency to rebel when it comes to politics. They have a tendency to rebel against the views of their parents. And that's the view that I had because that's the experience that I had. Um, going back a few years, uh, I remember having a conversation with my mother when I was home to visit. I was, had been living on my own for a while. And it was clear that she wanted to have uh, one of those dreaded lifestyle conversations with her adult son. She wanted to ask me something personal. I said, I have a personal question for you. And I you know, got my confidence up and I said, yes, what is it? She said, Arthur, have you been, have you been voting for Republicans? <laughs> <clears throat> and you know, I, thought I, uh, I felt so guilty. I felt like uh, changing the subject by declaring that I had been smoking pot or something, you know, something that would be a lot better in her view. Um, it turns out that my experience of basic political rebellion uh, is not as common as I once believed. Indeed, my own research has shown me that 75% of people with identifiable political views vote the same way that their parents did. Now, notwithstanding the fact that that was not the case in my life, my question is why? Your assumption, like mine, might be, well, most people grow up in particular circumstances, and their views, their worldview, and their values are formed by their parents. But the question may have occurred to you as it also has to me, perhaps it goes deeper. Well, James Q. Wilson is going to answer this question, or at least help us along these lines and ask, whether genes can, ex can explain our politics. It's an honor for me to introduce James Q. Wilson here today. Um, he has a long established pattern of taking on the cutting edge public policy and political issues of the day and answering those questions in ways that are relevant to the most important issues in our ethical, moral, and political lives. And in doing this, year after year and doing so brilliantly, he's become quite simply, the most influential social scientist of our times. Uh, when I, before I met him, he was called, uh, within the university where I taught, not by just his friends or his wife, the most important social scientist of at least the last half century. I know in point of fact that this is right. 
having been in this profession. Uh, virtually every corner of what I understand about social science methodology, about the ethics of social science, about the most pressing issues of public policy of the day have been informed in some way, shape, or form by Jim Wilson's research. Uh, his work is the gold standard for what we do. When somebody's really good in applied social science, you'll say, so-and-so is terrific, but he's no James Q. Wilson. Indeed, he's an intellectual national treasure. Uh, the Manhattan Institute has recognized this, and so has my institution, the American Enterprise Institute, where he's the chairman of our Council of Academic Advisors and a trustee to the organization, a trusted advisor for more than two decades to make sure as much as anything else that not we're just giving the right answers on public policy, but more critically, that we're asking the right questions. Uh, his work has influenced my own in ways that I can only be grateful for uh, uh, and will continue to be so over the course of my career. He's been a personal mentor to me in my research on philanthropy, my research on happiness, all of the other strange behavioral economic works that I've engaged in, reaching all the way back to my time at the RAND Corporation. Uh, when I was at RAND, at the RAND Graduate School, uh, I met uh, Jim Wilson, I admired him a lot, and one thing occurred to me that I think is important to point out. There's a famous old publication that the Rand Corporation published. It's out of circulation now. It's very politically incorrect. And the name of the, it's a little book that you can still find in the basement, in the basement library of Rand. It's called What is a Rand Man? Now, it's a, it's a terribly un-PC title because it's gender exclusive and all those things that we're not supposed to do these days. But if you look at it, it says it was at the height of the Cold War that it was published. And it said, what's a Rand man? A Rand man is somebody who's patriotic and adheres to the highest standards of research. It's someone who's driven by values and by science. Where have the Rand men gone? The answer is, we have one here today. James Q. Wilson is a Rand man, and I hope that by the end of the, my career, people will say that, in, at least under those definitions, I am too. I'm delighted to bring you James Q. Wilson. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, I was so impressed with that introduction, I wish it had gone on for 45 minutes. Uh, provided you didn't talk to my wife and she explained to you the many defects I bring to our relationships. Uh, many of you in this room are, like Roberta and myself, uh, parents of two or more children. And if you're parents of two or more children, my introductory remarks will not impress you at all. You know from, from your own experience that shortly after they're born, they tend to be different. One sleeps through the night, one wakes up all the time. One starts walking early, the other walks later. One sucks her thumb, the other doesn't suck her thumb. And you probably think that Genes must be somehow important in how children are formed. But then you go on and make two mistakes. And my lecture is about the two mistakes. You think that the influence of genes declines as you get older because now these children are under your benign influence and you are imparting to them your views and values. And secondly, you think that parental training, and not any other form of training, makes all the difference. Both of those statements are at least questionable and to some degree flatly wrong. So I want to explain to you why, though parents are important, they're not all important. I'm going to talk about how certain things are inherited, in particular religion and political ideology. Most people know, I think, that intelligence is inherited. I think some people realize that a tendency to commit crimes is in part uh, the result of genetic factors. I think many people recognize that certain psychiatric illnesses have a genetic origin. But I want to talk about these deeper, more fundamental questions, religiosity and politics. Let me take a moment to explain what I mean by the word inherited. When I say something is inherited, I do not mean that scholars can go to a given individual, such as Arthur Brooks, uh, take his DNA and point out to him uh, what he's likely to vo do, who he's going to vote for, what books he's likely to write, what psychiatric illnesses he might acquire. We don't have that kind of knowledge. What we say, use the word inherited, we mean that in a population of people, the population of a country, the people in this room, 
Uh, uh, we can say that by the result of certain kinds of measurements, differences among people can be attributed to genetic factors. Uh, it's not an analysis we do of individuals, it's an analysis we do of groups, and we do this in one of two ways. Uh, we look at adopted children and observe whether the adopted children as they grow up display behaviors that are more like those of their biological parents, whom they essentially never do, or more like those of their adoptive parents. And when we do this, we discover that though the adoptive parents' activities seem to have an influence on the children, they are much more like their biological parents. The second way we do this is compare uh, identical and fraternal twins. Identical twins, as you know, are genetically identical. Well, not precisely identical. They actually have different fingerprints. And it makes a slight difference whether they were born within the same egg or two separate eggs conceived simultaneously, but uh, they are, for all practical purposes, genetically identical. Fraternal twins are no more alike than any other pair of siblings. Uh, they share about, uh, have about half their genes coming from their mother and their father. We look at a trait among identical twins and discover what the correlation is among identical twins of that trait, let's say. Uh, the tendency to commit crime or their IQ scores or whether their uh, personality is extroverted or not. Uh, then we compare that correlation among identical twins with the same correlation among fraternal twins. And when the correlation among identical twins is higher than it is among fraternal twins, we say that the only thing that can explain this difference is genetics. That is to say, the fact that the identical twins are genetically indistinguishable. This has been done, uh, and uh, it's been done at length. And one of the first things we've learned, though this fact has not yet penetrated the public consciousness, is that the effect of genes gets stronger the older you get. Um, uh, Arthur may have been willing to vote as a Democrat when he was three years old. But by the time he was 25 years old, the genetic tendency to make him vote for a different party had become very powerful. We can see this with respect to intelligence, for example. We can estimate the intelligence of children when they're roughly five years old and discover there's a genetic factor. But by the time they get to be 26 years old, genes explain all of their intelligence. Uh, we may note that people uh, acquire certain religious sentiments uh, as the result of being reared by their parents. But we also discover that the older they get, the, the greater the strength of genetic influences on these, uh, on these uh, matters. Now let me come uh, to uh, political beliefs. Now I'm not arguing there's a, such a thing as a democratic or republican gene. Indeed, there is no single gene at all that explains political beliefs. Uh, there, are, there is no doubt some complex, yet to be discovered, array of genes that makes a difference. Uh, but uh, the fact that there is a genetic factor can be established by a variety of studies. Let me simply begin uh, with one done by political scientists John Alford, Carolyn Funk, and John Hibbing, uh, who a few years ago published an essay in the American Political Science Review in which they studied twins both in America and Australia. And they measured the attitudes of these twins with an interview. It was called the Wilson-Patterson scale, though I am not the Wilson after who it was named. This scale consists of 28 words or phrases, such as death penalty, school prayer, pacifism, gay rights. And the persons were asked to agree strongly, disagree strongly, agree partly, or disagree partly with each of these statements. They then compared how identical twins answered these questions with how fraternal twins answered these questions and discovered that genes in the study accounted for about 40% of the differences among people. Uh, on the other hand, when they asked people to say whether they were Democrats or Republicans, genes accounted for none of the differences. The party label you acquire, like the individual church or synagogue you may elect to join, seems to be in large measure the result of parental influences or the influences of friends. Uh, but the underlying political ideology that lies uh, beneath party labels seems to be significantly, though certainly not wholly, uh, influenced by genetic factors. Now, uh, 
there are certain objections you can make to these twin studies. Let me run through a few of them to show why I think the objections are probably wrong. Uh, one argument is that, well, parents treat identical twins identically. They dress them in the same clothes, put them side by side in the same stroller, give them the same toys, treat them the same way. And it's this parental influence that causes identical twins to be more similar than is true of fraternal twins or ordinary siblings when we don't dress, dress the same or treat, uh, treat in quite the same way. Well, there's certain uh, reactions one can make to this. Uh, first of all, many parents do not know whether their children are identical or fraternal twins. They make bad guesses. Uh, there's really only one way to find out. It's a karyotyping ex uh, exercise that physicians can perform. Many parents have it performed. They know whether the twins are identical or not. But a large fraction of parents do not know whether their children, though twins, are identical or fraternal. So when you do a study in which you actually measure the true relationship between the, among the twins, you discover that what the parents thought was true makes no difference. That is to say, the truly identical twins, as determined by a physician, are more similar than the truly fraternal twins, even though the parents mistakenly thought that fraternal twins were identical twins. Uh, another uh, way to deal with this is to look at identical twins who have been raised by different parents. There are not many of these worldwide. But Thomas Bouchard, a psychologist at the University of Minnesota, has assembled almost all that can be found, uh, a few hundred, and has published papers about their behavior. These are identical twins that were raised not only by different parents, but in some cases in different cities or even in different countries. I won't give you all of the fascinating details about these identical twins reared apart, such as the fact that they tend to acquire the same pets, they tend to give their pets the same names, and they tend to marry women, all of whom have the same first name. We'll just leave that aside. Maybe this is <laughs> rammed a noise in the data, but it's worth thinking about. The identical twins reared apart display the same views uh, with respect to personality. They are extroverted or introverted, neurotic or happy, uh, conservative or liberal. Uh, religious or not religious, even though they never knew their own parents. Now, uh, one question has been raised by some scholars who really want to nitpick this subject to death, saying, well, they, you say these identical twins were reared apart, but how long were they really with their uh, birth parents? The answer is the average time with their birth parents was five months. Now, I know some parents are extremely skillful, but I have met very few parents who can explain to people uh, when they're four or five months old the differences between liberals and conservatives or Baptists and Methodists or Orthodox or non-Orthodox Jews. Uh, I think we have to agree that uh, this quibble is uh, only a quibble. Now, the influence of genes on political behavior gets stronger the older you get. Uh, uh, scholars at Virginia Commonwealth University have shown that the Genetic influence on the attitudes of children before they become teachers is relatively modest, but by the time they turn 25, it has become all powerful. Genes also influence how frequently we vote. Political participation has a genetic component. Uh, three scholars at the University of California at San Diego studied political participation in Los Angeles County by comparing uh, how frequently identical twins voted with how frequently fraternal twins voted and discovered that genetic factors explain about 60% of the differences between people who vote and people who do not vote, at least among registered voters. Uh, that is helpful, uh, because if you think about voting from a rational economics point of view, it makes no sense at all. How can you possibly waste your time voting? Your vote cannot influence the outcome of the election except in those vanishingly rare cases when an election is decided by one vote. It's going to take you time to stop off, often in a rainy or cold November afternoon, to vote. Why do people vote? The reason they vote is they feel they have a sense of civic duty about voting. Why do they have a sense of civic duty about voting? Part of the explanation, an important part of the explanation, is they acquired genetically a commitment to a sense of civic duty. Uh, two of these University of California at San Diego scholars have, in a very recent document, believe they have discovered the actual genes that influence the willingness to vote. 
in a way that shows how genetic factors and environmental factors interact in interesting ways. They've discovered that uh, the genes that were responsible for producing monamine oxidase type A, it's a hormone in your body, um, or uh, a gene that produces 5-HTT, which is a neurotransmitter in your bloodstream, uh, increase your likelihood of voting provided that you attend church frequently. So that if you have the genes that produce these particular uh, hormones or neurotransmitters, but you don't attend church frequently, it doesn't infect how frequently you vote, but if you do attend church frequently, it does affect how frequently you vote. Suggesting that there are these complicated interactions between many different genetic factors and one's social experiences. Uh, I find this notion about genes influencing political behavior profoundly reassuring, and let me tell you why. I have been studying politics in this country for uh, half a century, and uh, one of the puzzles I've never understood is why, except in very rare cases, the election of George Washington, the election of Lyndon Johnson, uh, the vote in this country for the president is always 53% to 47%, except in the last 15 years where it's like 49.2% to 48.8%. How is it possible that in election after election, in good times and bad, depression, recession, wars, whatever, the country is split in half? Why is not that we don't frequently have elections where 75% of the people vote for the winner and 25% of the people vote for the loser? The answer may be that we are divided, and we are divided more or less permanently between people who lean towards liberal candidates and people who lean towards uh, conservative candidates. In fact, this leaning may be, this genetic influence may be even greater than the data I have suggested uh, reflects. And that's for a reason that uh, scientists call assortative mating, which can be easily explained by the fact that people marry people like themselves. Uh, opposites may attract in some theory, but uh, in terms of marriage, likes attract. Now, when that happens, when men and women who are alike, who like each other, and are similar to each other, decide to get married, it means that they are increasing their shared gene pool, shared with respect to some particular trait. And as a consequence of that, this will increase the genetic factor among fraternal twins, as well as among identical twins, should they have them. And this increase in the genetic factor, owing to the fact that likes have attracted, uh, have uh, 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 joined with likes, means that our estimates of heritability will be underestimates. The true estimate may, in fact, be much higher. Uh, some of you may ask, well, OK, uh, I'm prepared to believe that genes affect political ideology, but what genes? The answer is we haven't the faintest idea. Uh, and it's going to be a long time before we have the faintest idea. Uh, to answer the question of what genes do this, we have to examine the genomic code, that is to say the entire DNA code for thousands of people, see if we can find which genes separate among those uh, in those genomic codes, liberals from conservatives, or Methodists from Catholics, or whatever other trait we're interested in, and then uh, uh, do uh, an analysis that shows how powerful those genetic factors are. It's going to be a long time before we get to that point. Um, some of you know that we're using genetic analysis to try to identify people who are at risk for serious diseases, such as Huntington's disease or diabetes or Parkinson's disease. We've made some progress, but astonishingly little progress, even for something as specific as Huntington's disease. Uh, we have found it very difficult uh, to find out which genes uh, make a difference. And the, the reason for that is it's never simply one gene. It's some combination of genes, perhaps distributed across several chromosomes that makes these differences. Uh, let me give you another example of the fact that biology is not entirely destiny. There's a study that's been going on in a little town in New Zealand called Dunedin. Uh, it's been running for 25 years. A group of scholars uh, all over the world have been uh, contributing to it. They've been tracking how children grow up from the age of four or five to where they now are in their 30s. Uh, 
in this uh, uh, community. And they have been doing uh, analyses of their blood types, uh, analyses of what uh, kinds of neurotransmitters are rattling around in their brains, and analyses of how they're raised by their parents. And they've discovered that uh, those children who have very little serotonin in their blood are likely to ha be at risk for severe psychological problems provided they were abused as children. If they were not abused as children, they get over the shortage of serotonin. And of course, if they don't have a shortage of serotonin, if they have the normal amount, they will survive even abuse. So here we have the interaction between genetic factors that shape how much serotonin is going around in our brain and personal environmental factors, namely whether you're exposed to childhood um, uh, abuse. Now, another question you may ask is, well, all right, we don't know the genes, I'll take your word for it, um, but how can you explain gross changes in human behavior if they're genetic? For example, campus protests and attacks by the SDS on university administrators that began in the late 1960s did not occur because there had been a biological upheaval among the American people. It was because people disposed to liberal views were activated by events, those events being the war in Vietnam, the struggle over civil rights, uh, being exposed to group pressures among their friends that led them uh, to act in this direction. Similarly, uh, lynchings in the South in the 1930s and 40s and 50s did not become common because suddenly there was a biological upheaval such that ultra white ring genes were more common. It was because that people who might have been skeptical about civil rights were caught up in mob scenes, media frenzies, the shock of criminal events to do things in groups uh, which were, of course, terrible. Uh, now, there's many other questions about this, the genetic basis of political ideology that we can't answer. For example, I've talked about the genetic influences about making people liberal or conservative, and that all depends on the validity of this Wilson-Patterson scale of 28 questions to which you're asked to say, I agree or I disagree or I like or I dislike. Uh, this is a very clumsy technique because there are all kinds of conservatives. There are economic conservatives, there are social conservatives, there are fiscal conservatives, there are all kinds of liberals, economic liberals, social liberals, etc. Sometimes people have the entire liberal package or the entire conservative package, but just as often they pick and choose. They're liberal in some ways or conservative in some ways and the opposite in other ways. Our knowledge so far is so clumsy that we cannot clarify uh, these distinctions. But I do want to talk about one thing uh, which really bothers me about this subject and about which I want to pronounce loudly. Um, there is a view among scholars that there is such a thing as right-wing authoritarianism. The history of right-wing authoritarianism began in 1950 when Theodore Adorno published a book called The Authoritarian Personality. Now, Theodore Adorno was a German scholar who came to the United States to escape Nazi persecution. He was one, a member of the Frankfurt School of Thinkers. The Frankfurt School was a group of people who tried to combine Marxist and psychoanalytic thinking uh, before everyone realized that both Marxism and psychoanalysis were deeply flawed methodologies. And the book was an effort to explain fascism in Germany. And they invented something called the F scale, which is the fascist scale. And they interviewed people and concluded that right-wing authoritarianism would produce fascist-like children. Let me just read aloud a crucial paragraph from the end of the book. A basically hierarchical, authoritarian, exploitive parent-child relationship is apt to carry over into a power-oriented, exploitatively dependent attitude that may well culminate in a political philosophy and social outlook which has no room for anything but a desperate clinging to what appears to be a strong and disdainful rejection of whatever is relegated to the bottom." Close quote. Strong words. You would think uh, that these words would be open to some kind of question. Far from it. 
they are alive and well in academia. Even though at the time the book was published, a great sociologist and an old friend of mine, Edward Schills, argued that this argument was fundamentally flawed. It identified perhaps right-wing authoritarianism, authoritarianism, but it neglected left-wing authoritarianism. And Ed Schills pointed out that the Bolsheviks were as committed to party loyalty, were as hierarchical, were as preoccupied with intense political conflict, and were as suspicious of other people's conspiracies as were people on the right wing. Nonetheless, this has not prevented people from going ahead. Tom Bouchard at Minnesota, who's been leading the study of identical twins reared apart, uh, has uh, concluded that right-wing authoritarianism is, to a large degree, inherited. I'm a bit puzzled by this statement. So the last time I saw Tom, I said, Tom, uh, how is your research going at the University of Minnesota? How do the students there feel about it? Oh, they dislike it intensely. I'm always being picketed. My classes are being harassed. There have been death threats levied at me. I said, and you don't think there's left-wing authoritarianism? <laughs> and he said, you're a troublemaker, Wilson. <laughs> Bob Altmeyer, a psychologist at the University of Manitoba, has published a book on uh, uh, right-wing authoritarianism, which he finds uh, a powerful factor. And to give you a sense of what he means by right-wing authoritarianism, let me read a couple of sentences from the preface of his new book, newest book published in 2006. This book, he wrote, is about the disastrous decisions the American government has made. It's about how traditional conservatism has nearly been destroyed by authoritarianism. It's about how the religious right teamed up with amoral authoritarian leaders to push its undemocratic agenda on the country." Close quote. Uh, Altmaier may be a good psychologist, but he is a terrible political scientist. He does not even try to identify left-wing authoritarians and says, well, they may exist, but I don't know anything about them. Life in Manitoba must be a good deal calmer than life in Berkeley or Cambridge. There have been efforts uh, done by a scholar at the UCLA to develop a scale of authoritarianism that is indifferent to one's political outlook. So one can be an authoritarian, whether you're a left winger or a right winger. Uh, his research is quite fascinating. He's published a lot of data about it. Uh, and his research has never been cited in a single other psychological study. We have a problem in this country. Serious geneticists, such as Tom Bouchard, uh, have opened our eyes to important subjects, point asked to open it up entirely widely, and to talk about all forms of authoritarianism, they are simply reluctant to do it. Now, this leaves uh, uh, a question that I want to answer that I raised at the outset, and that is, what explains those parts of our personality? those parts of our political ideology, those parts of our religion. It is not explained by genetics. At the most, genetics explains about half, maybe a little less of the differences among us, except for intelligence where the, uh, the explanation is closer to 60 or 70 percent. What explains the rest of it? Our natural assumption is that parents explain it. There is a technique, which I will not describe now because I don't have a blackboard to put the equation on uh, immediately, to uh, separate out the non-genetic factors when we describe differences among people in a given population. And those two non-genetic factors are the shared environment and the unshared environment. The shared environment is what all children have in common, essentially what their parents are doing. They share these experiences in the household, around the dinner table, etc. And the unshared environment com is composed of two things a statistical error term, with which I won't bore you, but it's where social scientists put all the things they can't explain, they kind of dump it out there. And those things that are ex experienced solely by one child and not by the other. Essentially, they're friends. And when you look at political ideology, or when you look at personality, you discover that it is not the shared environment that contributes very much to their behavior, it is the unshared environment. It is what children pick up from their friends, their teachers, their colleagues, uh, their workmates, 
uh, that makes all of the difference in the world. Now, many of you may think that this is a sad commentary on parenting. If we make so little difference, why should we try? That's not the message I'm trying to leave. It is the moral obligation of every parent to supply a supportive and loving environment for their children. Uh, don't worry. The unshared environment explains two to three times as much as the differences among your children as your shared environment. You just have to relax and live with that fact. But that's not so bad because children are wonderful. And though they are different in birth and become more different, the older they get, they are still our most cherished position. Thank you so much. Professor Wilson, I'll answer questions. Uh, he'll acknowledge you, but please wait till the microphone gets you, because it's a big room. We want everybody to hear your question. OK. Uh, please. Hi. Um, you talked about genes versus environment. Uh -huh. There are other factors that are biological. I don't think they're, I'm not a geneticist. I don't think they're genes. For example, the older the mother is when she has a child, the more likely for Down syndrome. I, I'm, having I, I'm sorry, I'm having a difficult time. I'm saying, besides genes, there's yeah. also biology, yes. biological factors, such as yes. the older the mother is, the more likely Down syndrome. The older the father is, now they're finding out the more likely schizophrenia, yes. autism, and bipolar. Yes. So I mean, you just sort of broke it down to genes versus environment, but isn't there, um, would you put that in environment or in another aspect of biology? Well, I, I wish we knew fully the answer to this question. I will give you my instinct. My instinct is that uh, the consequences for children of being uh, given birth to by an older woman or fathered by an older man probably reflect the working out of biological processes. Now, there may be some environmental influences. It may be that uh, how they've lived, what they've drunk, what they've smoked, uh, how, et cetera, makes a difference. My guess is that that will be less important than the working out of biology on the parent's capacity to give birth to a functioning child. Bear in mind that in evolutionary history, a children tended to be born to women who were 16 or 17 years old and to fathers who were perhaps 20 years old. And in some cases, among the royal families of Europe, even much younger than that. Today, we've advanced to the point where People do not get married until they're in their mid-20s, and typically, in many cases, do not have children until their 30s. So we are, for the first time, experiencing in this world the consequences of having advanced the age of child rearing up to levels where it has never existed before. And we may, therefore, be testing biological limits that we were not aware of in the past. Right here. I'm Michael Myers, uh -huh. ultra liberal. Yeah, um, and, and, uh, Michael, I want to invite you back. I don't think I've ever given a lecture when you're not here. I'm very indebted to your loyalty. <laughs> it's in my genes. Uh, I thought I was coming to a satirical, humorous presentation on the subject, but given the seriousness of, the, of, of, of how your approach, let me ask you: uh, since the since democracy is dependent, the continuity of democracy is dependent on intelligent, informed, civic-minded people. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it is possible, if the pursuit of the gene is successful and it's possible to isolate and to test for the gene of intelligence, informed, mm -hmm. civic-minded people, mm -hmm. what implications does that have for at least American immigration policy? That's a very good question, and I would be uh, troubled uh, by our ability to specify with any degree of accuracy uh, the genes that are responsible in a given individual for a full variety of traits. Uh, it raises powerful questions about uh, uh, who should know this, whether anybody other than the person who has been tested should know this, uh, should the information be given to their employer, their insurance company, uh, the government. Uh, I worry very greatly about having that information widely disseminated. Were I being offered a chance to see my genetic code and being to be told how long I'm likely to live, what diseases I'm likely to acquire, I would say I'm not interested. 
Other people will be interested. And the country has not faced this question of designing a framework in which this information, once it becomes available, and that will be several generations from now, I suspect, uh, 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 once this information becomes available. Uh, the gentleman in the back, and then Uh, you, you mentioned a regression equation, basically, where the explanatory variables were uh, genetics and shared environment and unshared environment, and you mentioned an error term. Yeah. Where would you put free will or volition in that equation? That's going to be the subject of next year's Manhattan Institute lecture. <laughs> I, would, I would tell you the answer now, but unfortunately it takes me 42 minutes to do that. This gentleman here, please. Our approach today to political discourse is no different than it was several thousand years ago. Given what we're now learning in the last generation or two about ourselves as individuals and as a society uh, from the evolutionary perspective, cognitive science and neuroscience, how can we apply these insights, em empirically based insights, in terms of our self-governance? Uh, you like to ask big, complicated questions to which I don't have an answer. Um, I'm not sure uh, that it will be helpful to us in the process of self-governance. I, I think it may help us understand certain things that professional politicians already know intuitively. Namely, that when you fight an election, you're, you're really arguing about how to split up about 5% of the votes, because the rest are foregone conclusions to you or to your opponent. And so the fight over the 5% of the votes, which every skillful politician knows is what elections are really about, once that becomes generally understood, we may begin to reconsider our views about the so-called independent voter. In a typical election, 40% will vote for the Democrat, whoever that person is. 40% will vote for the Republican, whoever that part is. And 20% are up for grabs because they're called independent voters. But in fact, when you analyze independent voters, you discover the great majority of them are independent who always vote Democratic or independent who always vote Republican. Uh, so the struggle is, if not for exactly 5%, but some small single-digit number uh, is uh, is the price that, that politicians have to uh, struggle to pay. The other thing I think it may help us understand is that the political polarization in this country, which in my experience has become much worse in recent years than it has been in the past, uh, builds upon is the intensification of heritable differences we have. And that intensification, I think, comes from uh, changes in the environment, uh, the rise of talk radio, the rise of the World Wide Web, the rise of the internet, the rise of so many ways to being in touch immediately, directly, instantly with people who always agree with you. So that the chances of you being exposed to somebody who disagrees with you and having a serious conversation with that person is significantly reduced. That to me is, is troubling and I don't know what to do about it. Sir. Organisms, when subject to stress, will express genes differently. Yes. Um, and uh, that would seem to me to have implications for what you're talking about, because surely we live in a time of stress. Would that then work its way through to allowing us to have, uh, to overcome this genetic bias? Uh, I, I don't think so. Uh, the stresses, uh, I am not a biologist, but from my, um, perusal of the literature, the stresses that begin to distinguish identical twins one from the other, and these are stresses often experienced in the womb, uh, uh, do not occur at a sufficiently high rate to, to uh, offset the generalization that identical twins are genetically identical and will in a whole variety of ways be behaving in similar fashions. Uh, whether these stresses will increase or not, uh, I think uh, I, I'm 
not optimistic, they, and I do not believe they will, because modern pediatric medicine is going to great lengths to try to find ways of reducing stresses that pregnant women experience, uh, trying to get them not to smoke, not to use drugs, not to drink alcohol, uh, to, to stay calm. Uh, uh, all, I think, good advice, all ways that will, I think, reduce, not increase stresses. Um, who have I over, yes, sir. Uh, political, as you've said, political opinions uh, seem to depend on the pers on personal DNA. It's sort of a function, it's a function of the DNA. And I guess probably reproductive rates are a function of the DNA. So would one anticipate as years go by that, mm, that uh, some political views would reproduce faster than others mm -hmm. and so? Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Yes. Uh, the birth rate in red states exceeds the birth rate in blue states. Uh, that's in part because uh, the birth rate uh, in many red states is found in the south and the reproduction rate is higher in the south than it is in the northeast. But it's also true in some non-southern states as well. Uh, offsetting the tendency of conservatives to have more children than liberals, liberals' ranks are being increased by immigration which tends to bring more liberals here. Maybe in the long run, it'll all even out. <laughs> A couple of points. First off, um, the United States had one political party between 1800 and 1830. Mm -hmm. Was that due to a genetic shift of some kind? No. And then <laughs> after, um, <laughs> after the Civil War, there was a great deal of immigration from people with different gene pools, yet the two-party system remained. Yeah. And third of all, um, the 50-50 outcomes of the elections somehow reminds me of, uh, in litigation, plaintiffs t often tend to win 50% of the time simply because the two sides are rational. Mm -hmm. And so the 50% is largely due to like if two basically market-driven parties mm -hmm. that are trying to sell to the other side and they're both about equally good at it. And so you have 50%. Uh, that's, you know, that's what you're left with. So. Well, the 50-50 split uh, is possibly the result of uh, a series of coin flips uh, committed, uh, created by rational people. Uh, I don't want to sound like I have a disparaging view of the American electorate, but uh, I am not convinced that most people uh, probably myself included, uh, uh, are rational persons who flip a coin decide who to vote for. So I think there's probably a genetic influence in this 50-50 split. You're quite right, uh, the Federalist Party disappeared after 1800, and after all, attempted to secede from the Union, you know, and uh, that didn't go over too well. Uh, Thomas Jefferson became a, a quite successful president, and the Federalist Party disappeared, and this was the so-called era of good feelings. It had nothing to do with the fact that elections continue to be contested by people from both uh, from opposite views. Uh, the Jeffersonian Democrat Republicans uh, usually won, had always won. Uh, after the Civil War, immigrants came. Uh, did the immigrant gene pool change American politics? We haven't the faintest idea whether it did or not. Uh, it, uh, the, the, the immigrants uh, that came uh, were not really mobilized politically until uh, Boss Tweed here in New York City and his counterparts in Chicago and uh, Kansas City and other cities found ways of organizing them and getting them to vote uh, invariably for the Democratic Party. Um, so that I don't think that uh, the, the gene pool makes an immediate difference. It depends how people are organized. Why the two-party system? Uh, Two-party systems are natural. The really unexplained thing in our history is 1800 to 1830, and that was the result of a dramatic event. The Federalists trying to persuade New England to secede from the Union. One more question. There may not be one more question, Larry. Oh, yes. Where? Who? Yes. Heather. My question goes back to, um, was it Robert Wright who wrote The Moral Animal? Uh, the book, The Moral Animal, talked about uh, how, in fact, uh, 
gene expression didn't make much sense but by if you looked at it by individuals, but if you looked at it by the whole human species and it made sense for there to be a gene for altruism, for example, mm -hmm. or an expression of faith. Now, I'm curious what uh, work may have been done to try and explain why different political temperaments might have different inclinations in genetic structure. Why different political temperaments would tend to have different genetic bases. Um, well, let me, let me sneak up on this subject and then stumble before I answer your question. Um, first of all, um, there is a, I think a um, genetic as well as an environmental factor that explains why people uh, are more altruistic. Uh, Arthur Brooks, as you know, has talked about uh, how we give and pointed out that people who go to church give more even to non-church causes than people who don't go to church. But we also know that having strong religious views is to some degree a heritable trait. So this suggests that there is some heritability to at least that form of altruism, though there are other forms of altruism that uh, that subject uh, uh, doesn't cover. The difficulty with analyzing this is that serious biologists do not think that there's a, such a thing as group-based selection. So there's an altruistic gene. Now, this is not going to affect human evolution because altruists will always be taken advantage of by their calculating, narrowly self-interested colleagues who will exploit them. Um, I used to believe that until my research on the moral sense led me to conclude that altruistic communities tended to do much better in the world than self-seeking communities. The Yanomamu Indians of the <laughs> Amazon River are intensely self-seeking people and they spend most of their time killing each other in search for viable mates. Uh, whereas uh, England and uh, Sweden and the United States seem to do fairly well. Uh, but I felt timid about advancing this until I made this argument at a meeting of the American Philosophical Society whereupon Ernst Mach came up to me afterwards. Ernst Mach is the giant of American biology and said, you are right, this is the only form of group selection that really works. And I said, thank you, Professor Mach. I kissed the ring on his hand and I felt better about it ever since. Now, this is what I can react to your question, but I may not have gotten the question in its entirety, so let's talk about it further. Thank you very much. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. Supply the common sense and the fresh thinking of the Manhattan Institute.